Happy five years, everybody. I didn't know, do we call, I wrote this as five years with Trinity. You get to experience it as five years with Dean Owens. We are going to spend a little bit of time um, looking at the last five years. And I'm going to, it's going to be exciting, I hope, but it's also going to be hard. We're going to look at some things that were probably too tender to touch in the moments that they were actually happening. Um, but we need to look at, at them so that we can have some perspective on why we felt the way we felt about certain things and why things didn't always work the way we wanted them to in order to get to what I think is a pretty optimistic and hopeful place about where we are um, so that we can be building on, yeah, the, you shall know the truth, the truth shall set you free. Um, but it's also helpful to be able to look over our shoulders after we've, we're in a, you know, we've really seen some nice growth, exciting things happen in the last few years. Um, so I'm going to start, as I often do, with a teaching from the Congregate College of Congregational Development. Something, I, it's growing, something I wish, if I had the time machine, I would go back and give myself the encyclopedia from the College of Congregational Development. I would make sure that you all had a copy at every major transitional stage as well. I'm going to talk. I, let's agree to this. Has there been a lot of change in the last five years? Yes. Has there been a lot of change in the last 10 years? Yes. How, would we have wanted much of it? Probably not. Probably not. All right. But there's always some things we want. So let's first, this is called the J curve of change. I didn't create these slides. Um, but I, the, the bishop actually did, or she got them from the College of Congregational Development. Change is going to happen. And this is time, right? And hopefully our openness to the Holy Spirit. Things are always going to change at times we're not expecting. And they're going to change in ways we don't expect. And this is sort of a negative versus positive impact. So higher on the grid is positive. So when things change, whether or not we want it to happen, we have hopes. And I'm going to talk specifically uh, uh, here about Trinity over the last five to seven years, because that's been our period of change. So this can, can apply to smaller changes like a music director search or to changes in your life or in your community. So I'm going to go back to um, 2017, beginning of 17. Previous dean, uh, Dean Lynn, retires unaccept uh, unacceptably. I apologize. Un expectedly <laughs> uh, um, because of health. We know we now have to go through a period of change. We hope that we go through that and then we, you know, that's a period of change, but then we hire a new dean and things are going to go, what are we hoping for? What, what do we expect? Things are going to get better now, right? We've gone through an interim season. Now someone's here. I think when I look at this, you know what I think? We right? Doesn't that look fun? Things are just going to get better and better and better from the point where things are supposed to change, where things, something new is happening. What more likely, what happens, what reality happens usually is this. It gets not a little bit harder, far harder than we expect. And I, whoever played this was obviously having fun, took us down off of the grid uh, so that like, it really kind of was hard. And um, what I'm going to do is walk us through this, this J curve of change. It's actually in phases where in the first phase, th uh, think back. Did you feel this? At th here at Trinity or other places, shock, denial, anger, self-doubt. Why did we have to change? What does this mean, the loss? This will never work. I'm not, we're not going to be able to do this. This change is not going to work. And then you get through that first phase, hopefully, into a period of disruption. So you're still kind of, it's still getting worse before it gets better. And people say a lot of this, I told you so. I knew this was a mistake. It's going to get worse. Let's go back. Let's blame. Let's be mad at whoever we can see who's in front of us. Then if things are healthy and moving in a new direction, you start a phase of exploration. We, you're still discouraged, but also some acceptance, some relief. We still say, I don't know what I'm doing. 
things happen that are good, and we say, this is just luck. And you know, we aren't always failing. Maybe we can do this. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And then we start to rebuild. This starts feeling good. Pleasure, confidence, commitment. We can't, this isn't bad after all. We can do this. This is fun, and it works, and I'm all in. I'm all in. Now, again, whoever played with this has four quadrants and said there's a fifth quadrant. Leave that math aside. And that's mastery. That means not only have you survived, you're beginning to develop some new skills, joy, renewal. Why do we wait so long? We can do even more. I am open to even more change. Now, we can manage change so that... We are aware of these processes, and it is not quite so challenging and painful as we go along. And we get here a little bit sooner. And that's what happens when we're a little more thoughtful about how we go through change. When I shared this with the vestry, somebody pointed out, wait, that looks worse at first. Uh, and, and, it, and it often is. And we do get to where we need to go, but it can be, uh, there can be a lot more turbulence and a lot more challenges if we are not ready or thoughtful or intentional about how we navigate those changes. And now if I could go back a little bit farther, that's why you have interim ministry. You don't cover all four quadrants, but if you have, when you have an interim, Trinity had a two-year interim, which is actually normal. That's not a bad amount of time, especially for a place as large and complex as this. It's what you do and you don't do in that season that really makes the difference. And the idea is that when someone new comes on board, you're a little more in this phase. Um, but if you don't do that, you're still kind of in the first quadrant. And, and you have to do that interim transitional work at some point. You either get it done uh, in that season between, or you're going to have to do it retroactively. And that is a lot harder. But it does get done. And I think part of what we're going to talk about here is not so much a list of wonderful accomplishments, though we have all done wonderful things. But I want us to put in perspective what this season has been, how it's been different. For those of us who were here five, seven years ago, it was probably different than what we expected, not even talking about the pandemic. And for those of you who are new, and a lot of people in this room are new, it just gives you a perspective of where we are. And you know what? We are all new together. We are all, I think, here. We're all here, all of us. We are the congregation today. So we can't talk about the last five years without two very important sets of headwinds. Because we wanted things to be great, but there were, there were some realities. The first is that two-year transition from Dean Lynn to Dean Owens, and the work that really still remained when a new dean was called. Doesn't matter if it was me or anybody else. But we weren't really naming it, because we weren't ready to. Um, this is. This is hard. I'm going to name some really hard things. Um, many of you know this, but we don't know it from a kind of a data standpoint. From 16 to 18, we had a 35 to 40% drop in our Sunday attendance. It leveled out in 2019, but to a lower level than where it had been. Many of you remember, right? Felt like less people, right? Um, 44% of pledges that were here in 2016 had either reduced or had walked out the door by early 2020, before the first sneeze of the pandemic. And not only, that is gut-wrenching. And I say it's gut-wrenching also because like we're like, let's do new things, but this is partly about who, how we form pastoral relationships. And, and we build on trust. And we build on pastoral relationships. And when literally dozens of people don't even show up, how do you build? It's a lot harder. And the people who are left behind have tremendous feelings of grief, 
and sadness, which are understandable, but we almost always project that. Like, we want to blame. Blame doesn't do any good, right? The situation on the ground was what it was, but then we have to figure out what we do with it. How do we now move through and do some of this important transitional work? So I want to hold this up, and, and we're going to mention it in my annual report next week, and then we're going to move on. But the point is, I want us to look at that season and say, there was a reason why it was hard. There was a reason why uh, things didn't progress as, as fast as we wanted them to. And that reason may not be because one person did one thing that made us mad. And it may not even be because a vestry member or I wasn't exactly the right person in the moment. There, there is no human being. There is no human being who can walk in under these circumstances and say, let's go, everybody, and everybody goes. That's an important thing for us to name just to know that it's there. But that sets us up for very positive work. So that's the hard stuff. Now the good news. We have been rebuilding even in this very difficult season. There are, when we look at our pledge base, which, now remember, this is our pledge base, but three quarters of our income comes from endowment. So you didn't notice this like we would have had it not been. So, I'm glad that endowment is there. I want to take care of it. But also, it's not everything. Cathedrals, endowed churches have more freedom and flexibility to navigate seasons like this because of that. But it's a really important indicator of the health and vitality of the congregation. So no, we're not back where we were yet. However, of our pledge base today, 28% of it, about $120,000, is brand new in the last four or five years. Y'all, that's tremendous. I had no idea of this until I looked at this number four or five months ago. That means through this very difficult season, when things were, we weren't even in church for a year and a half, and when we came back, we were in a real rebuilding place where it has been really tough, we have continued to grow. So one of my case arguments is that we are not sort of starting to grow. We are two or three years into a period of growth. Just like when things kind of get bad all of a sudden, they never get bad all of a sudden. They've always been sort of trending that way in, for a little while. So I, want, I'm, I shared hard news, but only because we're now in a place where we're looking over our shoulders at it and seeing really great things starting to happen. And then. Did you hear there was a pandemic? <laughs> Just as, I had been here 15 months. So that is a blink of an eye. And what were those 15 months like? We're all kind of sad because the church wasn't there like it was before. So we never got out of that gate. And then the pandemic hit. So bleh. Uh, I mean, pandemics are, I, I've heard they, it's a 50-year impact. There are some ministries that are changed forever. There are some things that we have opportunities now. Think about digital online ministry. We didn't have before. We can now hold our, our finance committee meetings on Zoom and be done with it in 40 minutes and, and go down and go have dinner. This is great. <laughs> this is really great stuff. Um, but it also meant we had a time to do what we might think of as interim work. And what is that work? That work is trust building, that work is structural, and that work is vision casting. So um, I came across another graphic. Now I'm going to start talking about what we've done. Um, and I came across another kind of resource about a year ago. Uh, again, I wish I had a time machine and was thinking about this uh, when I started ministry. Um, but it was a, a graphic on thinking about how a congregation works. Really true of any system, uh, but in particularly a congregation. So think of it like the, you know, the triangle. Think about the tip of the iceberg. What does it mean to say a tip of an iceberg? There's a lot's going on beneath the surface. And what you're seeing is the sort of top, which is still pretty big if it hits your ship, right? Um, but it's still only a part of it. And the suggestion is that what we see, what we call the fulfillment of ministry, the things that we love, the things that bring you to church are going to be what? Shout it out. People, People community, liturgy, liturgy music. music, 
What, I'm sorry? Practice. Practice, yes. Kid stuff. Kid stuff. Homilies. Preaching, homilies. Coffee. Coff yes, coffee. <laughs> All right. I have yet to hear the word bylaw, uh, but we'll get to that. All of that, you need some, a foundation. Yes, 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 yes. That's church. That's why we come to church. So um, if I could take a look at this, and I hope in the back you can read this fairly well. This is the tip of the iceberg. But down beneath it, you've got to have all these pieces to get working together. Values and vision, your foundation. Bylaws and core documents. Woo! Um, leadership structure. Gifts. Operations. All of these things have to be somewhat in sync and in line for, for this to really hold together in the way that we want it to. And, and so what we really have done, and this is, um, I really can't say enough about the vestries that I've had a chance to work with over the last five years. Um, deeply supportive, deeply creative, uh, through hard times. And, and you all are very blessed to have um, strong leadership, uh, a culture of strong leadership, and, and one that continues to grow. So we don't want it to be a static culture of leadership. We are always inviting people in and hoping uh, that that will continue to grow. So I invite you to consider that in your own discernment. But we're going to start with values and vision. Um, that's the blue guy right here. Um, we did a, va a strategic visioning process, a sacred place for all people. Um, Core, we identified core values, things that have been a part of this church. They were here 10, 15 years ago. They were here 50 years ago. They were here 120 years ago. Integrity, dignity, transcendence, continuity, and faithfulness. Um, and continuity is so important to me. Our, we, we created um, uh, a mission statement, uh, I think, maybe about 15 years ago, early in Dean Lynn's time, uh, to proclaim in word and action God's justice, love, and mercy, which I just think is wonderful. Uh, it's very powerful. It's clearly who we are. Um, so we continue to hold on to that as our mission statement. Um, I'm going to use an example of what this looks like in practice. Um, we had community conversations around liturgy. Uh, how many years ago is that now? Whew. A while. Two and a half. Um, where we looked at values and visions at the heart of what was then the 9 o'clock service. It's still at 9. We now call it the abundant table. And we said, what, what's the sound What's the, that we desire? What's the spirit? What really drives us in the creation of this service? Um, and that came up. We held on to our notes. We used that in our conversation um, around seeking a director of music for the whole congregation. Uh, what are our values across a um, Sunday morning? Um, how do they connect? Where are they distinct? So it's how do we have questions like that from a values and vision standpoint? Um, then we did website and branding in 2022. So this is the fun part. So yes, you have to have bylaws and core documents. I know that there are one or two people in here who love this stuff. You don't have to admit it. It's always good to have one or two. I don't love bylaws, but I recognize that they are more important than we think um, because that housekeeping matters, especially if we want to be thriving over time. Um, we have less reliance on a small core of leaders when we think about the internal structure of what it looks like. Um, there's a discipline of ongoing attention to it and leadership cultivation. Um, and we have value. It means we have to keep checking in on our values. So we, we're doing some bylaw changes um, and this year, minor ones, uh, things like date of the annual meeting, uh, whether or not the treasurer is a member of the vestry, uh, a little less minor. But all of these we hold up to the realities to the, of today as well as are these choices consistent with our values? Um, leadership structure has been a really big change. Um, we now have, uh, we created eight mission teams um, where we're building community and ministry around a relational model. This is really hard to do, and Trinity responded exceedingly well to changing um, what was Cathedral Council to being open to trying something new. This was something that was deeply embedded in our bylaws. Uh, and, and for a congregation like this to be open to that 
no small thing. So I just want to say way to go, Trinity, um, for saying, let's try this. And it's a work in progress. We're a year and a half in. Um, there is still, I think, a great spirit. I apologize. This is my original graphic before we added diocesan and national ministry. Um, but once again, the idea is we're growing in ministry and in community around relationships related to the things that we are most passionate about. Um, so I'm really excited about this. And I think this, this is, there's a growing energy around it. And we're starting to see more and more uh, ideas that are offered by these groups coming to fruition. Um, gifts is something that I think we are, um, we still have a little bit more work to do. Uh, in 19, 2019 and 20, we really stabilized giving. Then the pandemic came. I want to also thank you once again. You all were very generous during the pandemic. Um, I, I can't say enough how much that meant, what that said about the strength and passion about this congregation and its commitment. It amazes me. For a year and a half, we didn't even let you in the building, but you continue to give. Um, that is no small thing. So thank you all. Thank you, thank you. Um, 23 and 24, began to see some modest growth. 23 and 24, we hired a director of development and community programming who came up with things like Gratitude Sunday, uh, as well as beginning to help us think through exploring plan giving and looking at our capacity for growth. Um, operations, in 20 and 21, we did a staff structure review, ended up changing the staff a bit, uh, hiring a controller, um, we in, also in 23, this is the same position as before, it's divided among two things. Uh, Cheryl Williams is our Development and Commons Community Program Director. So we're gonna be thinking a lot more about what operations, this is really campus facilities uh, and staffing and administration look like. Um, and we are just, after uh, about five or six month process, hired uh, an operations manager, which is a little bit different from our facilities manager um, title that we had before. Um, and we're right now doing a, a careful review of how we use this space uh, from everything from mission to revenue to staffing. Um, Kareen, I'm going to call you out for your hard work and your help in this conversation. Um, Kareen, who was our facilities manager, who served so faithfully and so well for nine years? eight years, for 17 years, uh, and uh, knows, and there's Dave Miano right behind her on the Property and Sustainability Committee, that this is really a time for us to say, let's make sure vision and values uh, are lined up as we think about how we use this place a as a resource and how we use it for mission. Um, so some intentional conversations all coming together. And then this is the fun stuff. Fulfillment of ministry, that we're, you know, this is the little orange triangle that is actually everything. Um, and we're seeing new engagement with community, uh, vibrant congregational events, things like the Bible study and the Dean's Forum. This has been, this has been wonderful to see these, uh, these forums over the past four or five months. Um, it, it, it helps to have little birdies along the way mentioned. And, and Jan, you had mentioned about six months ago, like, we really need to, to bring the forums back. Uh, and finding the right sort of, um, uh, uh, the right programming has been a challenge. We try sometimes, it doesn't always bring it back. Uh, but now as we brought it into more talking about where the cathedral go is going and my own perspective and vision, this has been really great. Um, we have seen an increase in Sunday attendance. We've seen an increase in, I'd say, vitality. Doesn't it just feel different uh, on a Sunday morning than it did um, just a few short years ago? When we go through change processes, they're healthy. We went, the hiring of a music director could have been painful. I thought it went quite well. Um, I'm really excited about Shiloh. Of course, it's disruptive, it's hard. We love a musician like Todd, um, but how we then talk about it is a really good sign. Here's an example. Those of you who are in the nine o'clock service, did something go wrong? <laughs> the mics went completely haywire on us. If that had happened two, three years ago, we wouldn't have gotten the service back, right? It would have been like, it would have dragged down the energy. And in this case, we bounced back, right? We figured out the mic, we kept going, 
and I think it was fine, nobody left, um, that you gotta look at signs like that um, for, for what vitality looks like. Now, let's look ahead for Trinity. Um, this really is a season, I think, of growth. I think we're already into it, but I'm gonna be really specific about as things are feeling far more positive now that we've gone through the J curve of change, and at this point, it doesn't, it's good to know, but there's not a lot of energy to put into like, oh, if only we dot, dot, dot. We're pretty much where we need to be. And we've actually learned a lot more because of the process. So it's more, what do we do with that information? But also, because we're in, can we move now into a sense of what they call mastery? But can we really claim some new things? And, and I would suggest that the next three or so years are gonna be really important that we kind of grab hold of that. Um, in a normal circumstance, this is actually pretty typical of a rector, the, the five to eight year period is or a dean is really important because enough trust has built up, right? You've gotten through some of these initial bumps. Now, I hope that doesn't mean at eight years I become a deadbeat. Um, that's up to us, right? We kind of keep mutually, I think that's a good time for us to reaffirm uh, uh, to one another that there is work to be done, there's a new season, there's things that we've learned. Um, it is a time of renewal, which I hope you're feeling, but also returning. And, and what I see often is people who fell away from Trinity, maybe during the interim, maybe 10 years ago, maybe 25 years ago, are, are coming back. Um, and we invite them back, we welcome them back. We're, they're so glad that we're here. Um, we've had, since 2019, 115 new people, new Trinity members, um, folks, some who have officially become members and many who are just active. Again, that's huge. Think about what we've been through the last few seasons, and yet we have grown in that. Now, one of the best things you all can be doing is really just bringing that kind of enthusiasm to church. Um, but you may also know some of those people who have fallen away. Um, take them out for coffee. And, and when they say, oh, but it's not the same, you, you can say, no kidding. It's not supposed to be the same. That's how it works. If things were the same, we're doing something wrong, right? That's changed. Doesn't, you don't want to make it worse. <laughs> I get that. You can always. But you all are the evangelists. And you all are there when that, those sort of animal spirits of grief kind of come to the surface in conversations. Um, and there's a season where that makes sense. But then when you're sort of this many years into it, it's sort of the time to say, all right, it's go time. Right? OK. So I mean, let's, let's go. There's a lot of really great things happening. So be agents of invitation and homecoming. And finally, I really believe that we are a few years into this. Um, we're not creating something out of nothing. Uh, we, are, we are building, we are building on, on some good things. Um, so next few years, a season of expansion and capacity building. Bring your creativity, bring your enthusiasm. Um, spread the word, we're gonna be talking about plan giving. Uh, continued ministry discernment, like the GCC conversations. And then looking at capital needs and long-term stewardship. Now, I'm gonna talk about myself for just a little bit more. Um, looking ahead for me. Uh, if we can look back and say, you know, this really has been a lot of sort of intentional interim, unintentional interim work that I think needed to be done. Um, I don't think any of us said five years ago, this is what we're excited about. But that was the work that needed to be done. Um, I am very excited. Before I say how excited I am, <laughs> I am excited. What happens after, when an interim is here and they do their work? They leave. They leave. And there's a reason for that. I'm not leaving, so I'm not trying to scare you. There's a reason for that. And the reason is, well, a few reasons. One is that they have to be empowered when they come in to do that work to sometimes make decisions that don't make everybody feel super good. And, and sometimes it can be hard. An interim's job, to me, is first and foremost to build trust. To build trust. 
And that trust really didn't get built, because that makes the trust building harder. And sometimes, in order to create that, they do have to make hard decisions, governed by the financial realities I pointed to, but governed by the participation realities. Um, and the other reason is sometimes, you know, I'll use a baseball analogy. Uh, a, a, a closer, a reliever is not the same as a starting pitcher, right? Different, different skills in different places. Sports ball, trust me on this one, okay. So in the ballet, the person doing the thing is not the same person as that. All right, okay, thank you. But it doesn't have to be that way because I also believe that we as ministers are always doing interim. And I think that this idea that there's a hard and fast, there's a person who is the dean, and then there's a person who does the change, and then there's another person who does the dean, I think that's a false narrative that we as a whole church have gotten into. So there will continue to be changes and we're gonna walk through it. Now, I, will, I wanna say very publicly that these five years have been hard. And that first year and a half was especially hard because of this. And over the past year, I have been doing some discernment, which is, would I want to do the last five years again here or anywhere? And the answer, I'm not gonna talk about the pandemic. The answer is no. Would I like to do the last year? Absolutely. That means things are growing and things are changing. And when I talk about what is in front of us, I really am excited. Um, I'll talk about my family. We love it here. You know, I, I, we put down wonderful roots. And I just, when I think about this community, when I think about all of you in this room, when I think about what we've been through, which has been hard, um, but sometimes hard is okay, uh, I'm really, I'm actually, I'm quite, I'm really excited about it. But it helps for my own process to sort of name that I caught the kind of brunt end of a lot of that grief. Um, it's very hard to walk into a church and dozens of people not show up on the first day. And some did and, and were kind of unkind. Uh, and so healing from that has been a little bit of the process. Um, it's all, this is a hard job. Every minister has tough work ahead of them. I just want to, in this one place, name that and now move on. Um, you also know, but the opportunity is one of recommitment. Um, the opportunity is to say, let's look at what we did manage, what we have done, and the foundations that are in front of us, and what can be done in the next few years. I think there's a sense of, of commitment there, recommitment, that is how you manage that situation. To say, okay, I'm willing to say I'm no longer an interim. I did it, I've done it, I don't care to do it anymore here. How about y'all? Do y'all want an interim or do you want a dean? I heard about it, but it's just... Uh... Okay, thank you. The altar call completed. Check. Let's move on. Good. Uh, I look forward to continuing through sermons and dean's forums and writings, things I love to do, um, to talk about how, how, I, you know, how I like to create and how I like to invite. Um, I, I also do have to mention that it's been a year of a season of great personal loss for me too. My, I have one sibling who passed away unexpectedly in 21. I've shared a lot of that. But when you go through something like that, um, and I'm going to do a forum maybe later this spring. I'm not sure about the date yet. Just my own journey with grief. You don't come out the same person. As we all, many of you have been through this journey. Um, and when you're in a, you know, as a pastoral leader, um, you really look at how, as a priest, how does this inform my priesthood? Um, all good questions, right? These are not like, these are just discernment questions that I hope deepen how we, we work together. But, but it does change. When you go through a pandemic, it changes what you prioritize. When you go through loss, it changes how, what you do and what you prioritize. Um, now, I'm also looking very much looking forward to a sabbatical. Uh, believe it or not, I'm due uh, in a year and a half. So not going anywhere anytime soon. But I am working with a committee um, to apply for a clergy renewal grant from the Lilly Foundation. The theme I'm working with is Vision Walk, uh, which will explore everything from uh, 
hiking and city walking and discernment and meditation through that, to some grief walking, to some exploration with family, but also there'll be a component uh, that involves the whole congregation for you all to participate in the work and the excitement of Vision Walk um, as well. And so if you have thoughts and questions about that, I would like to direct you to Jeff Spies, our senior warden. And actually, one of the important parts of the Lilly Grant, they want to know that the congregation is aware and supportive, right? They don't want to be like, well, you know, I guess he can go for a little while, uh, but rather, which would be OK. I, we understand that. But also recognizing that the point is to establish a season of renewal so that the congregation and the minister can continue to grow and thrive for years to come. Uh, and so that's kind of the theme. And in the next month and a half, we'll be getting that, that to them. Um, and then finally, um, I'm grateful for this place. I am, uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for letting me really be quite vulnerable here um, to share something that was maybe more than uh, typically a priest wants to share, but I thought it was important. I, I really appreciate your generosity of spirit. Um, and I really love the ministry of this place. And I walk through the cathedral, and I am still humbled every time I walk through. Uh, and I'm still humbled by the commitment and the spirit um, and the warmth of this place. So I thank you, and I'll see you in five years for part two of this presentation. <laughs> so. so there is a time for question and answer. It's really, we've got 10 minutes. It's, it's pretty open-ended, whatever you would like to talk about. Um, you can have a microphone. Would you thought about our, do you plan to keep, I mean, that was very impressive. Have you thought about our you plan to share with the congregation what the next five years look like from beyond what is on the board? Obviously. Yeah. I think a lot of that is going to be, do that. I think we want to do something. I'm not sure. Oh, no, I like the trolls. <laughs> We have invested so much energy on just, um, I think, getting to a place of health and stability that the next probably four to six months are, are times. And the vestry, we're, we're having some pretty rich conversations about this right now, about so what is this three, you know, if in this three years of, of capacity building are going to, what's it going to look like? So things like the GCC one-on-one -on -one conversations are going to be really helpful. Because as some people mentioned, you know, I really want to get involved in affordable housing. That helps us to know, get a real read on um, not only where the passion, the commitment are, is, uh, but where we can put our energy. Um, I think bringing, uh, I, you know, my, I'm excited about Shiloh Roby coming on board. I think we will continue to expand our presence in the community uh, in terms of our music program. So I'm looking forward to some really great things uh, happening there. Um, I, think, I think that's there's a little bit of a stay tuned there in terms of the answer to your question, Howard. Because I think now what we need to be able to do is do this discernment work not forever, but at a place where we're, we all kind of realize that like we're in a positive place. I sometimes find I have to be like, we're in a good place. And we're like, oh, right, we are. And then we should have, and now we're going to have that, that, a little bit more of that conversation. I will add one more thing, and that is the presence of Cheryl Williams as a development and community program director. Uh, has been really huge in helping us to form that question. Because we're already seeing more things like the Philadelphia 11, uh, like Becca Stevens, like Joan Chittister coming in the, uh, in the fall events. Where, I mean, we've already got 170 people coming to Philadelphia 11. Um, so more and more of that stuff is going to be coming uh, online. Barbara. I know it wasn't really possible during the pandemic years, mm -hmm. but um, 
and I'm sure you are, but tell us how you are involved with some of the Cleveland civic organizations mm -hmm. in the city. Yeah, the, um, she asked how I'm involved in the Cleveland, Cleveland civic organizations. Uh, I assume you don't mean, do I go to the art museum on my day off, but I do. Um, one of the best experiences that I've had has been um, uh, Leadership Cleveland. Uh, and that is something that uh, Marie was a part of, that's something that Dean Lind was a part of, uh, and that has been just an incredible experience of connection to Trinity uh, and to, um, to, to, the, to the wider community. And so I had a fabulous experience of an intensive year with leaders from healthcare and the arts and the nonprofits. Um, and you know, went to a Christmas party with them last Wednesday. Uh, I'm going to be meeting on Monday with the director of Leadership Cleveland to talk about affordable housing. Uh, and after that, I'm going to have an exploratory conversation with another community developer about Mather. No update there, but just to let you know that I continue to have those conversations. Um, we about Mather Hall. When we had Becca Stevens here um, talking about human trafficking, uh, I called Leadership Cleveland and said she is here. And they put together uh, a, a, the following morning, we had about 60 people from Leadership Cleveland uh, gathering over at Luther Metropolitan Ministry to hear from Becca. So that it wasn't just a, a conversation with us, it was we were projecting that uh, into the whole city. Um, I'm also on the campus district board. Um, and you, you see a lot of our guests from forums, things like Marty Yule from uh, Community West. We're going to have Tanya Maness, who is head of um, Cleveland Neighborhood Progress, is going to be a, a forum guest on. In January, we had Dan Moltrip here about a year and a half ago. So that's another way that we continue to connect people in. So, um, and then of course, and then you know, some of us are going to go to the City Club this coming Monday to uh, to hear from Naomi Tucci, Bishop Ann, and a few of us will be resplendent in our collars, uh, being the the loud mouth Episcopalians in the corner. So. Naomi Tutu, daughter of Bishop, Archbishop Tutu. So, so yeah, we we are we love being active. And let me tell you all, people love, people in the community love to see Trinity get involved. Um, they they loved it. They love seeing uh, Dean Lind involved. They love seeing me involved. Uh, they're very supportive. We're involved with Greater Cleveland congregations as well. Um, some of those places, you know, are also going through similar life cycles that, that Trinity did. So there's there's always navigating multiple things. So yes, definitely involved in the community. How are we doing? Anybody else? Diane. Speak right into the microphone, please. Um, I want to say thank you to you for putting up with us. Because <laughs> oh, likewise. Really. We, um, I've, I've been here probably for 27 years, and um, we did go through an extremely difficult time when Dean Tracy left. Um, she was a very dynamic person. Um, and then we spent three years in limbo. I never knew there was such a place. There's a place. Um, yeah, it is hard. After that, you know, it, you came on board for, I don't know, six months, and then the pandemic hit. So, um, and that's been a two-year walk. Um, it's been a tough road for all of us. And thank you for putting up with us. Well, thank you for likewise. Thank you, Diane. And, and one thing I would say, in fairness to everybody involved, one thing I have learned is a um, Trinity, Trinity is a complex place. And I mean that in the best way. A cathedral is a complex place. 
Um, I was at a conference, and I was, by for good fortune, sitting next to, I'm going to drop a name here, Dean Randy Hollerth of National Cathedral. Uh, and he said, someone told him when he went from being a parish priest to being a cathedral dean, he said, you're maybe going to use 60% of your parish skills here. Uh, or maybe 60% of what you're going to do here comes from parish skills. So you have to learn a bunch of new skills. Um, and, and, and I would say when you go through a long period of limbo like that, it's very hard to coast in a church like this because we have expectation and need, and that's a good thing. We want to continue to be doing those dynamic things that a cathedral does and does well. And that when, when we're in extended periods of limbo, it's a lot harder to keep that going, which I think has a lot to do with why you had a lot of attrition. Right? It's not like one person did something bad. It's just it takes a certain level of energy and skill just to keep that kind of coasting. And I. I, not many of us have that skill fully empowered the minute they walk in the door. There is a learning process. And that's where thanks for putting up with me, too. Because what we have in that first year that I was here was kind of going through the very normal learning process as well. And that's, I think, where the pandemic hits us hard. Because we don't have that chance to be like, OK, now let's start to, to figure out where we are. So, I think that there's a lot of pieces in that that led to that limbo feeling particularly limbotic. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie. That just, that just reminds me of something I've heard called liminal time. Liminal where time. Where you're not where you were, and you're not where you're going to be yet. And yes. That that helps me understand that period of time. Thank you. I, I also, um, and I want to answer Howard's question a little bit better. Um, I, let's you and I have coaching sessions where I can answer questions faster in the moment. I think there are two areas, three areas where I do see us really throw it, growing and thriving. One is in community engagement through tr Trinity Commons. Um, we have talked about this a lot, how that's an important part of our life, but the more we intentionally program it, the stronger it's going to be. Uh, the second, that's why I do the J-curve of change, which is this congregational development stuff really helps us to grow. That energy, when things feel good, that's there for a reason. That's because we've sort of done a lot of this work. And then I'm also looking forward to supporting the diocese. We have a new bishop, and I think that we're in a new season of ministry where we need to be helping other congregations, whether Episcopal congregations or not, by creating things, resources, services that can add to what they're doing so that we're not taking away from their communities, but are, are helping them to feel connected and to the church in ways that churches that just don't have the fortune and resources that we do can do it. So now that my wife is the pastor for digital ministry, I'm taking notes on what she's doing and be like, there's some pieces we can borrow from that. But how many, some of you all go to church here and then you go to church online at the cathedral. We don't lose anything by that. It simply deepens. So a cathedral can be very much an agent of, of deepening the experience of the Christian life while not taking away from the parish and community life that makes all these other churches churches um, what they are. So I really see us as a part of a, of a symbiotic system, but it helps us to be a little bit more intentional about that. The Boar's Head is a perfect example yeah. of providing something to the community. And in Cincinnati, that's, that is four services over a weekend, which I believe with the new yeah, the, director, we will grow to that point. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> sure. I want to add one thing to Diane's thank you. In addition th to thanking you for putting up with us, uh, one thing I've learned about you in the five years you've been here is that you take the long view. You don't really expect that 
you know, we change one thing and all of a sudden everything's going to be wonderful. You really take the long view and say, well, you know, this is a process. We need to, we need to give it time. And I think that's so, so helpful. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. We, is your hand up? Would you like it to be? Sorry. So let's draw it to a close. You're going to see some of this content in, um, in the annual report. It seemed like a good time to kind of share this triangle, the iceberg, and whatnot. And, and then um, it's really helpful to be able to name this, but not to dwell on it, right? We were where we were. We are where we are. Uh, and we have just such great opportunities in front of us. Uh, it'll be built on relationship. All things are built on relationship, especially in the church. Uh, it'll be built on trust, uh, on creativity, uh, and, and on hope. And, and I'm, I'm all in for it, and I uh, hope you are too. Thank you all.